all right let's deal with sympathetic ophthalmitis today so sympathetic ophthalmitis is a sight threatening disease obviously because it concerns the human eyeball but it also has a very high visual morbidity so for some in some ways if you can somehow cure the disease which is very difficult so sympathetic ophthalmitis is very difficult to manage somehow you manage to you know bring the reasonable amount of vision to the patient this vision will never be good enough there will always be residual disease that is present in the eye residual diminution of vision that is present and that is why it is a condition with a very high visual morbidity it is bilateral affecting both the eyes at the same time but it is asymmetrical which means one eye is usually affected more than the other and it is affected earlier than the other eye it is a condition which is non necrotizing it is a granulomatous condition and it resembles a pan uveitis so pan uveitis meaning all the layers of the uvea the iris the ciliary body and the choroid all three are affected at the same time usually there is some history of penetrating ocular trauma and it is more common if there is a uveal tissue prolapse which means say for example if the patient had a limbal tear a limbal injury with prolapse of the iris then such a patient is more likely to develop sympathetic ophthalmitis as compared to a patient with just a tear without any uveal tissue prolapse so what causes sympathetic ophthalmitis there is no single known cause so when you don't have a single cause you are able to enumerate risk factors so the most important risk factor first and foremost is penetrating injury more specifically in the ciliary region which is also known as the dangerous zone so if injuries happen in the ciliary region there is a very high likelihood of developing sympathetic ophthalmitis injuries elsewhere less common and particularly if there is uveal or lens capsule incarceration in the wound you have an increased risk of developing sympathetic ophthalmitis the second risk factor is surgical procedures because surgical procedures after all are also a form of you know controlled trauma to the eyeball and intraocular procedures which more commonly are vitro retinal in origin so say for example the patient had to undergo silicone oil implantation or you know uh, an intravitreal injection such patients such procedures are more risky for the for progression to sympathetic ophthalmitis and so is iridectomy because there is a trauma to the iris tissue directly so the uveal tissue is damaged directly other extraocular procedures such as cyclo cryocoagulation or nd yak cyclophotocoagulation procedures which are done in absolute glaucoma are again risk factors childhood is a risk factor so children are more likely to develop sympathetic ophthalmitis as compared to other adults and that is because children usually have a stronger immune response to trivial trauma the incidence of you know sympathetic ophthalmitis after penetrating injury is 0.2 to 0.5% and after intraocular surgeries is 0.01% on an average so if you can see penetrating injuries are obviously much more common and are much more progressive towards sympathetic ophthalmitis compared to intraocular surgeries so what is the problem where is the problem lie the problem lies in an allergic or an autoimmune response by the body t cells are incriminated in this procedure and the uveal pigment that is released after the trauma starts acting like an allergen it incites an allergic response so like a lot of structures in the body such as even the lens protein which is present inside the lens capsule also known as sequestered proteins if these are released into the systemic circulation these in inside an immune response these cells are foreign to the body and hence a foreign body like reaction is incited and inflammatory reaction begins the other theory is that viral infections cause uveal protein damage and the same mechanism of revealing of these uveal proteins that are previously sequestered is in, is uh, you know considered whatever the etiology whatever is the problem the end goal the i'm sorry not the end goal the end result is that there is a granulomatous uveitis in the exciting as well as the sympathizing eye so what is this concept of exciting and sympathizing eye the eye that sustains trauma is the exciting eye and the other eye the eye that does not have the trauma but still shows a granulomatous uveitis is known as the sympathizing eye so sympathetic ophthalmitis affects both the eyes but the sympathizing eye is affected more because that is the eye that uh, you know is unaffected and shows a lot of inflammatory reaction so you get nodules so these nodules are consisting of lymphocytes plasma cells epithelial cells and giant cells so basically all the inflammatory cells that you can see bottom left image i want you to look at the small white pock marks on the retina so those are the nodular aggregates that you see bottom right image is the histological image notice the brown layer at the top and bottom of the uh, you know um, the the image so that is the melanin pigment that is seen so pigment disturbance is seen in the retina or in the choroid 
uh, in a case of granulomatous uveitis. A very specific clinical feature is seen called Dallin Fuchs nodules. So this is a clinical pathological diagnosis in which both clinical appearance and histopathological diagnosis is required to call it a Dallin's Fuchs nodules. So these are obviously the aggregates, the inflammatory cells that are present, but also pigment epithelium proliferation. So the pigment epithelium starts proliferating, more pigment cells are seen around the lesion and it is such a lesion, so this Dallin Fuchs nodule is located between the Brux membrane and the retinal pigment epithelium. In simple words, it lies between the retina and the choroid. Bottom left image, I wanted to see those mounds of melanin pigmentation, which is seen by those blackish coloration on the histopathology. So those are the Dallin Fuchs nodules. I want, now look at the right side image, just look at the arrow head at the top. That is an active Dallin Fuchs nodule. At the bottom, if you see the arrow, that is a healed or a, a chronic Dallin Fuchs nodule that you can see. The other pathological change that you see are perivascular infiltration in the retina. An interesting feature is seen. If the exciting eye shows purulence, which means already pus has started forming, that eye has formed an endophthalmitis or a panophthalmitis, then such an eye will not produce sympathetic ophthalmitis in the other eye. And this has been postulated because uh, you know, if there is purulence, that means there is so much damage of the uveal tissue that there is no way that the you know, uveal tissue can incite an immune, autoimmune response in the body. It will only incite an inflammatory reaction which will destroy the eyeball and produce and you know, pro further pro progress of endophthalmitis or panophthalmitis may occur. But the other eye will not be affected because the uveal tissue is completely damaged and it is not exposed to the, to the normal host tissue to produce an autoimmune reaction. This is not a hard and fast rule, even endophthalmitis and panophthalmitis cases show sympathetic ophthalmitis in the other eye. But it is very often seen that if purulence is present, then sympathetic ophthalmitis does not happen. So what clinical features are you going to look for? Let's divide it into the exciting eye and the sympathizing eye. The exciting eye will show iridocyclitis just like any other case of acute anterior, anterior uveitis. So there's going to be congestion, lacrimation redness and the presence of keratic precipitates. Now these keratic precipitates are going to be granulomatous, so they are going to have a mutton fat appearance. In addition to this, there may be some evidence of obvious trauma, penetrating trauma with a low grade inflammation and there may be a prolapse of the uveal tissue as seen in the bottom right image. At the one o'clock position, you can see the iris tissue is trying to come out through perhaps a sclerocorneal wound. Now let's look at the sympathizing eye. The sympathizing eye shows a reaction 4 to 8 weeks later. So suppose I have a trauma today, maybe a month or two after the trauma, my other eye is going to start showing reaction. But 80% of the cases will present within 3 months of uh, you know, the stimulus, either a trauma or an intraocular surgery. And it is basically an acute plastic iridocyclitis. So what do I mean by plastic iridocyclitis? A very severe anterior uveitis. So imagine grade four of cells, grade three of uh, you know, flare of the anterior chamber, that sort of a reaction is seen. The earliest symptom is photophobia and a decreased near vision. The near vision is affected because ciliary body is the reason why accommodation occurs. So if the ciliary body is inflamed, it is affected, there is going to be functional laser and if there is functional laser, then the function of the accommodation is lost. Hence, near vision starts getting affected. The earliest signs that you see are optic nerve swelling and bilateral exudative retinal detachment. It is very difficult to see because there is so much inflammation happening in the anterior segment, which may sometimes even go into the posterior segment. But these are the earliest signs that are you know, clinically seen. Vitreous flare and cells because obviously the choroid is going to get inflamed and this inflammation is going to extend into the vitreous. Mutton fat keratic precipitates because this is a type of granulomatous reaction. One very interesting thing that you see is if you see mutton fat keratic precipitates, the infection is either very severe or recurrent because it takes time to develop mutton fat keratic precipitates or you need a very severe inflammation for it to develop. So if you see mutton fat KPs, it is either a severe or a recurrent disease. And obviously because there is so much inflammation, the eye is going to be a tender eye. In addition to this, those white fluffy dots we saw, those are the multiple choroidal infiltrates which are seen in the mid periphery of the retina and eventually over a period of time as the inflammation is going to reduce you are going to have a feature called sunset glow fundus this is also seen in one other condition called voked koyanagi's harada's disease or vkh syndrome and this may take up to two years to develop because the inflammation in such a condition is very chronic it is a low grade chronic inflammation so it takes time to develop and it also takes time to reduce if at all it reduces 
Two interesting facts that you need to remember. The patient may directly present with features in the sympathizing eye. So the exciting eye may have completely be bypassed. There may be very little inflammation that may be seen in the exciting eye. In such an eye where inflammation is not seen to an extent, it is all is also called a white eye. So it may directly present with features of sympathizing eye and the attacks may be intermittent with a quiet eye in between. What do I mean by this? There may be an attack a sudden remission of couple of months and again the inflammation flares up this may happen in the exciting the sympathizing or both eyes how do you treat this condition the first treatment is to prevent it you want to prevent this sympathetic ophthalmitis from developing so prophylaxis the first question that i will ask in a in a patient of penetrating ocular trauma is there chance of useful vision if i operate on this patient if there is a chance then if there is no chance then i have to excise this injured eye i have to remove the eye because first of all there is no visual prognosis and secondly this may cause sympathetic ophthalmitis in the normal or the unaffected eye so excision of the injured eye is the only solution when there is no visual prognosis and enucleation is preferred over evisceration so by enucleation i mean the entire eyeball along with the optic nerve is removed whereas evisceration means that the sclera is left behind with only the contents of the eyeball removed Enucleation is preferred because with evisceration there is a very small risk that the sclera may already be involved or there may be a remnant uveal tissue that is left behind. So to avoid all of that enucleation is the best option available. However, if vision can be salvaged then meticulous wound repair is to be carried out. So if it's a corneal tear you need to do a corneal tear suturing with 10-0 ethylon. If it's a cornea scleral tear then the cornea needs to be managed with a 10-0 suture and the sclera needs to be managed with an 8-0 suture. So 8-0 is thicker than 10-0. Since sclera is a tougher tissue than cornea, you need a thicker su suture. You have to make sure that no uveal tissue is left inside the wound. If there is iris tissue prolapse, then that iris tissue needs to be abscised, which means cut out from the body and the remaining iris needs to be pushed back into position so that none of it comes back into the wound. Steroids are obviously required because you want to reduce the inflammation. This inflammation is not just because of the trauma, it is also because of the autoimmune response. So steroids are required. Systemic is the most preferred route in which you give it 1 gram IV over 3 days, which is pulse therapy. Then the patient is shifted on a high dose oral steroid therapy, the usual tablet, this tablet prednisolone acetate, and the dose is about 1.5 to 2 milligram per kg. So it sometimes it may be as high as 100 milligram per kg dosage. So slowly the oral steroids are tapered along with that if necessary periocular steroid injections can be given and topical eye drops are continued for a prolonged period of time say for a couple of months or sometimes even as long as one year. The steroids show a more dramatic effect if the sympathetic ophthalmitis has already occurred because imagine the function of steroids the steroids will reduce inflammation. So to reduce inflammation if there is more inflammation then the effect of steroids is going to be more pronounced. So say for example I see a very dramatic reduction in the inflammatory reaction in a patient after administering steroids, I should not actually be happy, I should be worried. I should be worried that sympathetic ophthalmitis has already begun, so I need to be more cautious in such a patient. Topical antibiotics and systemic antibiotics to prevent any secondary infections, either due to the trauma itself, due to the introduction of any foreign body inside the eyeball, or as a cover to steroids. I continue this therapy for two weeks and if there is no control of uveitis which means the signs and symptoms do not reduce I have to excise the eyeball I have no option because I am putting both eyes at risk at the same time suppose sympathetic ophthalmitis happens both eyes are affected at the same time if there is again I ask the same question is there a chance of saving vision in this patient is the trauma traumatized eye possibly going to have vision in the future if the answer is no, then I have to perform an excision. So I have to remove the eyeball, preferably within one week of the trauma. Steroids again, all routes of steroids are administered. You have to try and reduce the inflammation. And immunosuppressants are often used either as steroid sparing agents or where steroids do not you know, give sufficient reduction in inflammation. So the common drugs that are used are azathioprine and mycophenolate. Cyclophosphamide and chlorambucil are useful in refractory cases, in cases where azathioprine or mycophenolate may not be useful, do not show a response or are contraindicated. So that takes care of sympathetic ophthalmitis. I hope this lecture is useful to you. As always, thanks for watching. Please leave us a follow on Instagram at i.excel. Subscribe to the channel because we will be coming up with a lot more updates in the near future. Thank you for listening. Thanks for watching. Stay indoors and stay safe.